welcome to your Pennsylvania ancestors. This is Denise Allen, and I'm so glad you could join me for this episode. In 1948, President Harry Truman stopped in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and was introduced to Allegheny County's Parthenotary. Truman, confused, infamously said, what the heck is a Parthenotary? So if you ever thought the same thing while researching in Pennsylvania, you're in good company with a former U.S. president. I was honored this week to have Jonathan Del Calo, Berks County's Parthenotary, share what he does in his elected office. Jonathan is a genealogist himself, and will also tell us about all the various historical records he's maintained in his office. This has been a real special treat for me because I live in Berks County, and I really enjoy everything that our courthouse does to preserve the history of this really unique place in Pennsylvania. So if you're taking a second look at the records you already have on your PA ancestors, you just might want to dive into the records at the County Pathonotary and see what they have for you. And now, here's Jonathan. Jonathan Del Calo, welcome to the Your Pennsylvania Ancestors podcast. I'm, I'm so excited to have you on the show today because you are going to talk to us about what is a prothonotary? So, That's could right. you, um, yeah, I can't wait. Big name. I, <laughs> it is a big name. It's a tongue twister for, at least I, it was for me at one point. Uh, President Harry S. Truman, <laughs> he attributed uh, the, the name prothonotary as the most impressive sounding political title in the United States when, when he met a prothonotary in 1948 in Allegheny County when he was on a campaign stop. And he didn't know what it was, and he was introduced to one, and he was quoted as saying by several news sources, what the hell is a prothonotary? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so what is a prothonotary? And, like, well, if you were talking to a middle school class that brought you were. in, you know, like, you know, talk to us like that. Like, well, like tell us who you are and how you got into being a prothonotary. Okay. And, yeah. Well, I was, uh, I'm from Berks County originally, and I'm a genealogist as well. That's one of my hobbies. I've worked, I've worked with the county for 20, almost 21 years, and I've been in this office since 2006. I was a, uh, originally the chief deputy prothonotary when my predecessor retired. I became the acting prothonotary. Uh, the prothonotary office is an elected, what we call a row office in Berks County government. So I was elected. I ran for the office in 2017, and I was elected. And I've been here uh, serving in my first term. At the prothonotary, to boil it all down, it is really the chief clerk and the record keeper of all the filings related to civil cases in the Berks County Court of Common Pleas. That is the easiest definition. Now, that encompasses a lot of things. Anything that's civil or family-related we handle. We do not do anything criminal. So any murder and all that stuff, that's all with another court office known as the clerk of courts. The clerk of courts only handles criminal matters. The prothonotary handles all civil matters. Uh, we do a lot of things. We record civil actions. So uh, slip and falls, medical malpractice cases, things like that. We do family court matters, like I said, and those include divorces and custodies. And every so often we have a, a petition from a, from a minor to, to want to leave being parented by his parents. And I, I'm trying to think of the name off the top of my head, but they're very rare. Um, we have a lot of judgments that we file. E equity actions are judgments are a certain part of our office that, in, that encompasses a whole bunch of liens. We, we, we file federal, state, and local tax liens, municipal liens. So if you're not uh, paying your trash bill and the municipality slaps a lien on you, <clears throat> it gets filed here. And we also file uh, appeals to higher courts. So if you have a case in, in our civil court and you're not happy with the decision, 
You can appeal it to one of the higher courts in the, the court structure in Pennsylvania. Uh, we're also a passport agent for the United States Department of State, so we take new passport applications, al although they're suspended now because of the, uh, the virus outbreak. We also file a bunch of orders, decrees of courts. We work very closely with all the civil and family judges. So we enter all the orders in, the decrees of court, we issue writs, we process many other legal documents. Uh, there's a variety of reports, for instance, that are filed by uh, county, uh, municipal, and school districts, annual reports, financial reports. We're a record keeper for all those types of reports as well. That's one aspect of our office. Genealogy, as we'll talk a lot about here, is another big aspect uh, of the office. But yeah, that's a I, quick little summation of what the office does. I, my head's spinning because I'm thinking you guys must be like moving all day in terms of contemporary society and we, what you're... We are. We yeah. are because uh, at the last count, there's literally probably, I think, between four and 500 t different types of filings that we could file or that this office has filed in the history that the office has been established. But wow. some filings we don't see maybe for 20 or 30 years. So we always have to remain highly educated about what type of filings could be coming in. We don't know. One of my funny things I always like to say to, to people when I speak is uh, sometimes the budget department or the county commissioners will say, how come your revenue isn't up? And I, I tell them, well, judge or, or commissioner or budget man, I can't put a sale out on divorces. I can't. <laughs> advertise, you know, two for one deal on custodies and divorces. <laughs> and they're like, okay, we get it. We get it. But uh, yeah, there's, there's a lots and lots and lots of different filings that we could, um, that we could handle at one time. And one that I always refer to is um, we had a case one time with a funeral home. Unfortunately, a family, uh, a, a person had passed away and a funeral home came and took the body and did all their services and prepared the body for burial. And the, 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 the family who supposedly was going to be taking care of all this just disappeared. Mm. So the, the funeral home literally was like holding on to this body and they, they didn't know what to do with it. So they made a miscellaneous petition to our court. And I, I remember looking at it and it was petition for burial. So they actually made an emergency petition with the court and the judge granted it an order that they could bury the body. And then they went after him in a civil case. But um, you <laughs> see strange things like that from time to time. That's for future genealogists to uncover in uh, 50 years or something. Yeah. If you find yeah. that one unique case for sure. Is it Because in that case, if, if it was a, a somebody's ancestor, who's somebody's descendant who's going to be researching that in the future, I mean, the petition had person's name, when they were born, when they died, where they died, the address that they died at. So even in a petition like that, there is some genealogically valuable information that somebody could, could obtain in the future. That's true. So talk about that in these filings and, and realizing that records really vary and the kinds of things that get filed vary by yeah. time period, mm -hmm. right? Like, so like divorce wasn't a thing for most people until... Right you know, more contemporary time, like the 70s, 80s, That's you know, 90s. Right. Yeah. Uh, we, we I mean, it divorced. happened, definitely. Right. But We uh, uh, have really no divorce filings before about 1900. Okay. Um, I don't know if people just didn't get divorced back then, which is, which is pretty, you know, you didn't have a lot of that. But they, our records with divorces really don't start till around 1900. Okay. And uh, the early ones, like the, the first 30 years of the 20th century, 1900 to 1930, some of the divorce, most, almost every divorce, there was a master assigned to it. It never really got in front of a judge, per se, unless there was serious uh, disputes. Mm. Most of the cases were, uh, and it was almost always the feet, the, feet, the wife who filed it. Uh, but sometimes there were hu uh, husbands who filed against their wives, uh, I guess the wife was very abusive and that, that was possible <laughs> back then and, and common, not common, but it was mostly common for the husband to beat on the wife. Yeah. Um, but they would file a divorce and then 
it would immediately be, be assigned by one of the judges to a divorce master who would then meet with the parties, take testimony, do whatever investigation he, he would have to do. It was no female attorneys back then, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. And then he would issue a report to the judge with a recommendation that, yeah, the parties, they need to be divorced and go on with their lives. And then the judge would just sign a divorce decree. That was the majority of the filings back then for divorces. However, most of the masters, their testimony that they took from each of the, from usually the, the plaintiff, they didn't really talk to the defendant a lot. It was usually the, 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 complain, the complainant, the filer of the divorce. The information is unbelievable. Uh, I've had people come in and they get those files and they're like, this is so, it, it's really a snapshot in time. Because when you look at the transcript, the first question the masker almost always asks, when and where were you born? When and where was your spouse born? And when and where were you both married and by whom? So right off the bat in those divorce filings, you're getting some really good genealogical information for major events for a couple. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on from then, then once you get that out, then it gets into the really good aspect of the genealogical research, the storytelling aspect. You know, why are you seeking a divorce? Well, he went out one night, got drunk and came home and started beating on me. And I saw him with his girlfriend down on third street. And then we went to <laughs> Joe's saloon. I took my sister and we went to Joe's saloon and found him there. And, and, and it goes on and on and on. It's really like a, like a, almost like a novel. Uh, oh, into man. these transcripts and they're they're amazing and people love searching through them i've had people come in who aren't even related to the parties they just look at them just to get you know some funny stories or some funny complaints however back then they probably weren't that funny but yeah the divorce filings are, are we get a lot of requests for them well if you were looking for something to feed your brain to write a fiction you Absolutely. know a novel like a type of like that would be many many stories like that what other civil matters, probably common bankruptcy, would might make people? Yes. Run? Oh, yes. Um, and well, uh, no, no bankruptcy um, because that's a federal action. So that oh, okay. That would be filed out of the bankruptcy court. But we do have uh, bankruptcy type filings. Like if somebody's involved in like uh, one of our most common type cases is a credit card company filing against somebody who didn't pay their credit card bill. Okay. And they might, that person might end up declaring bankruptcy. Well, then we'll get a filing from the bank, from either them or the bankruptcy court saying that uh, Jane Doe or Jim Doe defendant has, has a bankruptcy action in, in the federal bankruptcy court. And then that, that, what that does is it stays our action then. So we can't proceed. The plaintiff cannot proceed then. It, it's an automatic stay under the law. Mm. Um, so yeah, bankruptcies are, are federal. But a lot of people come into research and, and we always direct them towards the federal bankruptcy court uh, here in Reading uh, to, to research those, those records. Because I've had in my own family, my great grandfather, he had filed for bankruptcy and those records can get very interesting, you know, where your assets and your, he, he had some businesses in the twenties uh, before the stock market tanked. And, um, and he had to file and those records are very interesting, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, you have to list, list assets and almost like in a state where it, when the, with, with a probate report with contents of a house or contents of an estate, uh, some of those bankruptcy records are, are like that, very detailed. There's uh, always the record, to, I think, to look for that you wouldn't normally put your hands on. So um, for people that have only researched online, you know, these kinds of records are, are very unique, very specific. And you, I don't, I mean, they might be digitized. Like your office has done a phenomenal job in terms of Thank digitizing, you. but yes. accessing, accessing them from your pajamas at, you know, 1130 yes. on a Saturday night, it, mm, probably not yes. likely. <laughs> Um, right. in the near future because of the size of the files, the complexity right. of yeah. storing them? Well, literally millions of pages of records. And what well, we have a date, we have a searchable database on our website. So even though the records aren't there to look at, the database is there so that if somebody does find something that they are interested in, they can shoot me an email and then I can send them the image of whatever they were looking for. So we have that service available. Going back to the digitization, 
we've done over about 500,000, half a million pages since I, since I became prothonotary. It was one of my primary things that I wanted to do and one of the reasons I ran. Berks County was founded in 1752, so that's when our records start. And about a month after I was, after I was sworn in, I was, you know, I mean, I was acquainted with the office because I was the chief deputy, but I wasn't, I was, wasn't drilling down into the nitty gritties of the job. And I was looking through some of our old records from 1752 and I opened up this box and it literally was almost like a, just a, a pile of pulp. Mm. The, the, the papers had deteriorated that badly. And they were, I will never forget, and we have some pictures, um, they were wrapped in like this old twine that I guess the prothonotaries or the deputies used back in the day. And some of them probably hadn't been opened in at least, I thought, 75 to 80 years, which is when this courthouse was built. So they had to have been taken out and they were probably gone through, but they probably weren't touched for at least 80 to 85 years. And I looked at these records and I was like, oh my gosh, I mean, these are just, these are literally on the verge of just being lost forever. And I immediately said, I, we got to start preserving these. And I was uh, my counterpart in, <clears throat> in Lehigh County, uh, Andrea Noggle, who's, she's a saint. She's a wonderful person. She told me about a vendor that she uses that repairs these records and then digitizes them. So I got in touch with them and we've had a tremendous partnership. And the great thing is all the money that is, being used because it's expensive to digitize because not only are we digitizing, we're actually using archival tape that I get from Gaylord supply and Ar Gaylord archival. Mm -hmm. and, and it isn't, it isn't cheap, but we're repairing the documents and then scanning them so that the scans are, are just nice. We're not like, we could just put pieces together and it almost looks like a, like a puzzle or a cut up type puzzle. And I don't want to do that. I wanted them to look as original as possible. But the funding, we're not using any taxpayer money for this. The good thing is about 25 years ago, the Pennsylvania, the General Assembly of Pennsylvania enacted legislation that allows us to collect a $5 fee on all of our filings. And it's called an automation fee. <laughs> and that goes into a separate account. So we use that fund to pay for this. And that was the intent of the, uh, of the legislature, that uh, budgets are tight, County commissioners, they really don't give, not, I'm not speaking for all county commissioners because there are some that are very historically conscious. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you take a poll of most county commissioners in Pennsylvania, their top three issues in their counties, I don't think record preservation and retention is going to be one of them. They're probably working, like in, for instance, in Berks here, you know, they're working on a, building a new jail perhaps, right. uh, you know, a, a countywide nursing home funding shortages from the federal government. Now we right. have this COVID-19. So that's why the General Assembly enacted that is for, so off the prothonotary offices can use this fund when they don't get the funding that they need in the regular county budget. And that's what we use. I'm happy because, and I, I wouldn't be too upset to spend taxpayer money to preserve the records because I think that's one of the main duties of the job. But as of right now, we're not using any taxpayer money and that makes me happy. So we've done over a half a million of our historical records, what I call the historical records, the writs, the petitions, things like that. And then we've digitized over 50,000 pages of our naturalization records. And that's one of the main records that people come here for, for genealogical purposes. And I could talk an hour about national, naturalization <laughs> records. We might need to book another time slot for that. that I'm always something. glad to do it. Yeah. Oh, that's great. But the naturalization so, records are so significant for genealogists, uh, especially ones that are, they have immigrant ancestors. So like my own family didn't come here till the early 1900s. So I go back three or four generations. I'm, I'm done. I'm to the pond, as, as they say in genealogy, you're, you're ready to cross the pond mm -hmm. for records across the pond. And Luckily, a lot of people, when they came to America, they wanted to become citizens and they naturalized and they filed a naturalization petition. And the records, and I'm sure you've seen them, they're, they're unbelievably detailed. Sometimes they, well, they do. They, they give a, a height and weight a lot of times. 
eye color, hair color, just physical description. Uh, if it's a if it's a, a a male, if he's married, it lists his wife's name, her maiden name, when they were married, where she was born. It lists their children. But the main thing that people come and get those records for is because it lists the name of the village in Europe or whatever country that they came from. So the researcher can then make uh, start to do research on how to get records, mostly through probably the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, because they've, they've pretty much imaged and microfilmed as many vital records in Europe that are available. And that's what I did with mine. Uh, so then they can trace their families back even five, six, even more generations. I have my line traced back to the 1600s in Italy, which is pretty much as back as far back as it can go. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> That's it, it, was, it was quite a task, uh, especially with the Italian records. Um, but I still have work to go with my German ancestors. I mean, I'm like a child of the immigrants. I have German, Croatian, Hungarian to read some of those records. I mean, I have such a respect for people that speak like multiple languages because just to look at the records, not even speak the language, but when you go from looking at, a, at an Italian birth certificate to looking at a Hungarian birth record, it's like two different worlds. Yeah. I mean, it's really, really interesting. Before we move on, I, I can't let pass the fact that you've taken on this heroic digitization and not because it was something that you had to do, like somebody, you know, forced you to do right. it from above. It's something that you, as a genealogist and just a lover of history and, a, you know, just really yep. appreciated the records, right. took it on. And I just want to thank you on behalf of anyone who's listening or ever researched in Berks County because... Oh my goodness, we need people like you <laughs> to have this office that. and do this. And, 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 and one of the, and I appreciate that so very much, Denise. And, and it's, I do it because I, I, I am still, I don't do much research anymore because I've been really busy with my day job. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I, I am, and I was one of, one of you, one of the genealogists that, that, that listened to, listen to the podcast and that are still researching. So I've been to the courthouses and I've seen the records in the basements of some courthouses around the country that are damp, that are moldy, that are lost forever. I've seen that. So I, I've had those experiences and, uh, and, and it just kind of stayed with me as I've continued in my uh, public service career and especially in the county level. Uh, and, and, and it stayed with me so that when I was able to be afforded the opportunity by the citizens of Berks County to be in this job, it was a main thing that just came right to the forefront. We have these old records. We got to get them digitized. I do not want them lost forever because you never know 200 years from now, somebody's going to say, wow, man, these records are still here. Thank, thank good. And, I, and I'm not looking for that. I'm, uh, I was told one time by a county commissioner, doesn't matter how great you do in your job, 100 years from now, most people aren't going to probably know who the heck you are and that's fine with me just so that the records are are preserved yeah uh, so that's why I do it really because I've been there I've seen bad records I've been a I've looked at records that are lost forever and it and it pained me it really mm -hmm. did because uh, it could have closed some gaps in some of my research which is still open uh, especially some Connecticut records and some Massachusetts records that I just I'm still having a difficult time finding some of my my mother's family but that's why I do it, you know, for the preservation and just so that because I've seen it, I've, I've, I've lived it when, when given the opportunity to, to, to be in charge or, or the temporary custod custodian of these records, you know, I, I don't want to go to my grave whenever that is, hopefully in 100 years or so, <laughs> thinking, you know what, I, I should have preserved those records and now they're lost. I, I couldn't live with myself if that was the case. Oh, well, it's, it's a Herculean task and thank you, you know, really thank you. I just, it, it's, I appreciate I, I'm that thrilled. I, you know, I brag about Berks County all the time. I'm, I'm not a, I didn't grow up here. I've, I've been here 20 years, but I'm really proud to call this my home County because it of the work that county. you're doing and, you it's, know, it's and a like, wonderful it's, county. it's a wonderful, you, you guys are, are doing things that are just really at the front edge of, 
of and, technology and, and preservation and, and it's great. And I'll and, tell you, I was, I went to college in Washington, DC, and I had a real hard decision to make because I had like the George Bailey mindset when I was in college, you know, I'm getting out of Reading, I'm getting out of Berks County. When I graduate, I'm going to see the world. I, I, I was very, very close to remaining in Washington when I graduated and, and probably could have gotten a nice job in the federal government or with Congress because I'm a congressional and presidential historian type nerd. And, uh, and I could still be there to this day living in the outskirts of DC and commuting in and doing all this stuff. And I said, you know what, I want to go back. I, I, I want to get, you know, it's something, I, it's just, it just, it was the local history type thing was tugging on me and, and, uh, and, and we did that. And, and I, I'm so glad that I did because, you know, Berks County, I mean, it's a wonderful place. And, and Larry Medallia, who is the register wills and the clerk of the orphans court here, he really, you know, he has a lot of the, he has birth and death records and the probates and the marriage records, which are the real juicy crown jewels of genealogical information in Berks County. And he really set the, set the stage for, for this type of a genealogical uh, groundswell uh, with, with all the work that he did. And Larry is one of my closest friends. So I saw that too, as I was working in the county and saw what he did. And I said, you know, I'm going to get into that same type of mindset if I can get a chance to do it. Uh, but all of us here, we're, we're all very conscious of our records. Uh, we have a county archives that that maintains uh, the records that that are, are stored off site and uh, yeah it is a real first class county and i love living here and I, I love telling people about berks county and what we've done and it's surprised when i get requests from australia which we have <laughs> and from europe of course and from from uh canada and and even i think i believe we we had a request from latin america one time and all these people have their roots in Berks County. It's, it's really amazing. It really is. Does every county in Pennsylvania have a prothonotary? I do have to ask that. So, oh, yeah. No, no. Yeah. The, most, most counties do. Every county in Pennsylvania has, the, the, uh, it has a clerk, a civil and a uh, civil clerk. Whether it's called prothonotary or not depends on if the county is a, what we call a home rule county. Mm. So Berks is considered what's called a third. Berks and, and a majority, a large majority of the counties in Pennsylvania is called a, is a third class county. We have eight classes of counties in Pennsylvania, but there's a, a codified statute of law county code and the third class county, we're a third class county. So we're governed by the county code. The county code says you have a prothonotary and you have a clerk of courts. Now Lehigh County and Delaware County, and uh, I believe there's a Luzerne County. They have opted, their citizens have opted to go with a home rule charter. So that's a, where the government restructures itself into a form that it feels can better serve its citizens. And they change titles. So okay. for instance, and sometimes they combine offices. So I always use Lehigh as the example. Uh, you know, I'm just a prothonotary of Berks. We have a clerk of courts of Berks. We have a re recorder of deeds of Berks, and we have a register will of Berks for individuals. Lehigh County, Andrea Noggle is the, what they call a clerk of judicial records. So when they organize their, their home rule government, she is in charge of all the prothonotary records, all the clerk of courts records, all the recorder of deeds records, and all the register wills records, wow. all in one office. As she wow. is chief deputies. That, that administer. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad to just have this office. I, yeah. I don't know how Andrea does it up there, but she has four really good chief deputies who I know, and they do a really good job running their little sections for her. Uh, and Delaware County is a little different. They just, I think, uh, they're very similar to Lehigh, but as long as it's not a home rule county, the um, office will be called prothonotary. But some of the smaller counties uh, the prothonotary and the clerk of courts could be combined. They have both records and they have to be familiar with both offices. And then even going down into some of the really small counties in Pennsylvania, uh, you might even get the register wills to throw in there and the recorder of deeds. So there might be one person that will be all the offices other than the sheriff, the district attorney and the main offices like that, that have to have to stand alone. 
Mm -hmm. So it's very, very different. But I'd say in 85% of the <coughs> counties in Pennsylvania, there is a prothonotary and they all have these records. And okay. the name prothonotary, by the way, I always like talking about the history because people are like, what is prothonotary? What <laughs> yeah, is please do, please do. I mean, it's, it's a... It's, a, it's, a, it's an English word that was first used in, I believe, 1466. That's when prothonotary started to be used. And it, and it really means, you know, clerk of a court. And, but it takes its name from a Latin, a Latin term, prothonotarius, which is kind of a cool word. And that, I thought the Latin had ended. But when I researched it, when I first got elected, here it came back. It's really a Greek origin. And, and the Greek word is proto-notatios, which is a Greek word for first scribe. <laughs> and as, if, there, if you have any birders that are watching, which I, I, I'm a big birder, we have a bird named after us, the prothonotary warbler. And it's a beautiful <laughs> yellow bird and mostly yellow with some black wings. And it got its name from the uh, the proto notario in ancient greek was a chief clerk in the uh, in the court of the Byzant in the, of the byzantine empire and the chief clerk of that court the pro notario he wore golden yellow robes so mm. the, the the i think it was a french gentleman in louisiana who first discovered the prothonotary warbler i guess this word was in his brain when he saw this bird and he saw the beautiful golden uh, color of the warbler and thought of the Byzantine court clerk with golden yellow robes. So he decided to name the bird the prothonotary warbler. Wow. And that's how, that's how the bird got its name. But uh, <laughs> I never thought, I always thought it was a Latin or an old, what we call an old English term, yeah. but it really is a Greek term. Proto meaning first, it, it, the technical real term is first notary. So proto notary. Mm -hmm. And and that's the origin of the word. I have a couple ceremonial duties that I do in addition to just my regular job. Uh, I do I administer a lot of oaths to county personnel, assistant mm. districts, district attorneys, all of the row offices, chief deputies. I I give them their oath. I administer their oaths of office to them. And uh, my one of my other roles is. In the old days, which the old days is prior to 1940s or 50s in Berks County, Berks County had what was called a court crier. So all the ceremonial <laughs> functions, this this man would be all dressed up in this fancy outfit and he would give all these loud verbiages and stuff and declare court open. Well, somebody in their infinite wisdom put that role with the prothonotary. So I open court for all the ceremonial court functions. So naturalization ceremonies and mm. the, uh, when, <clears throat> when the bar association welcomes new members into the bar association or, or on occasions that are very uh, solemn and somber when we memorialize uh, attorneys who have passed away. Mm. Uh, the prothonotary always opens court. Sometimes I do the Pledge of Allegiance, sometimes I don't. But I like it because I, I'm the first person on and then I can just sit down and enjoy the, the rest of the program. But that's a, what, I, what we call a ceremonial duty of the prothonotary. You're giving us such a behind the scenes view of, of what it's like in a courthouse, you know? It's, oh yeah. It's, yeah, this is great. I love it's it. It's a great place because, and I love the courthouse. I mean, I'm here, I'm here probably more than I'm at home because I love it. I mean, I, I wake up every morning, I come in, I see the building and, and our courthouse, if anybody has never seen the Berks County Courthouse, and we have a big blue building, which we call the big blue building called the Services Center, which is attached to the courthouse. Right. And I'm so fat every morning, the, one of the first things I always thank God for is that I'm, my office is in the courthouse, not the Services Center. <laughs> it's the Services Center. It's a nice building, but it's just tall and blue and bland and just yeah. has no, no character to it. The Berks County Courthouse, however, all 18 floors of it, Commissioner Leinbach once described it as, if you could imagine when you're reading about Batman and the superheroes, if you could imagine what the courthouse of Gotham City looked like, it would look like Berks County's courthouse. It is such a very cool art deco courthouse. And when I researched it, and I found that 
it took 18 months to build in 1931 and part of 1932. I just couldn't believe it. I just could not believe it. I mean, they worked seven days a week pretty much. And I guess it was a, a pretty, uh, a pretty warm winter like what we just had in order for them to do that. But I, I could not believe, plus the courthouse that we're in now, the, the courthouse that this replaced was on the same footprint. So before they could even build this building, they had to tear down the old courthouse, mm. which was only three stories, but still uh, they had to tear that whole thing down and then prepare to build this building. And they got it all done in 18 months. It, it's just amazing. Yeah, and if anyone gets a chance to visit in person, it is unique yes. because a lot of counties either have gone to the more modern courthouse, yeah. right? The bigger counties, like you're right. describing like the services center, which is that modern Correct. glass-sided building. Or they have the, the smaller counties have the old courthouse that was the mm -hmm. first one that they built, you know, mm -hmm. in like the 1850s, 60s, 70s or something. Like, then they're right. just a whole different feeling. Um, yes, so the, the Art Deco 1920s is unique, I think, across Pennsylvania. Before we wind up, I do want you to give genealogists listening who are new to doing on-site research, like what are some tips or advice, like how, okay. how do you, like if they figure out what county their ancestor was in, like what, what do you advise them to do? To well, the next? first thing I always advise anybody is go to the office's website mostly every county in the in the commonwealth now has a web page and now some of the offices websites are a little thin than others but the first thing is you want to go to that website and familiarize yourself with the records that that office holds okay. one of the most common errors that researchers get is they come in here and they're like yeah i'd like a copy of my birth certificate i said i don't have that uh, <laughs> it's a state record well, what if it's after, what if it's before 1907? Okay, well, it might be in the Register Wills office, but we don't have any birth records. Um, so it's very important to familiarize yourself with the records that that office holds that you want to research in. And then I always, I always encourage uh, people to just reach out with a, with a, usually the emails are the best way. Phone call, you know, is, is okay too but I would encourage them to email the office or, or visit. Uh, I wouldn't visit though uh, without giving a call first or giving an email first. And, uh, and with us too, we have a mobile app and I believe we're the first county in the, in the state. And the app developer tells me we could be the first in the country type of office that we are to have a mobile app. And I always thought that was important too, technology as we go forward with the digitization. Uh, so if people download our mobile app, which is available on Google, uh, I, I'm an Apple guy, so it's, I'm, I'm used <laughs> to the Apple store, but the Google store, the Google play or something like that, it's available on both platforms. There's a whole bunch of stuff on history and genealogy on our app and also on our website as well. So if they just Google Berks County Prothonotary, it, it'll come right up our, our website and uh, we have the, the links to search our historical records, to search our immigration and naturalization records. So if somebody wants to check to see if they have an ancestor who might have naturalized in Berks County, they can check that out, just put the name in, and if they, they get a hit on it, let me know. Uh, our naturalization records, I'm proud to say they start around 1798, and we have them digitized up through June 1st of 1930 now, which is a good we're getting, we're in the process right now, our vendors in the process right now of imaging 1930, July 1st, all the way up to into the 70s, which is, wow. which is really, really good. One of the filings, which we didn't talk about that we do do that are, that's really, really serious and really, really vital and is our protection from abuse filings. And, mm. uh, and that's one of the reasons as I'm talking to you, the, the courthouse is locked down to the general public, but we're still here. I'm here with a skeleton staff, mainly to, fu to uh, take care of our PFA filers, protection from abuse filers, wow. and any emergency filings that come in, yeah. uh, like emergency custody or uh, emergency, some other type of emergency that the court deems as vital that we have to be here for. So we're here. Uh, but protection from abuse, I've loaded up our app with a lot of resources for protection from abuse victims and if they need help, where to go mm. and, and how to get in contact with us. And 
So I, I'm always pushing the mobile app because there's a feature on there to, to if you want to send me a message directly, it comes right to my email and I'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. We have a, a, a search form too, if you want to uh, request a search. So we have a lot of stuff on there. I always encourage everybody to either go to the app or go to our website. They can find out a lot more about getting some of our records if they need them. Oh, that's fantastic. And I'll definitely put a link in the show notes to the website oh, and the that's app great. and, you know, so people can check it out, even if they don't have ancestors in Berks County. It sounds like you've got a ton of educational material on there where yeah. people can learn. Oh, yeah. Jonathan, what else do you want to share before we we uh, um, sign off about the about the prothonotary or? Well, I'll tell you what, we'll, we have, you know, as opposed to all of our records that I just talked about, you know, mm -hmm. the naturalization, we have a, a group of records that I find are fascinating, what I call the fascinating records. They mm -hmm. don't really apply genealogically, but they could because, and I'll go through some of them, like some of our very interesting records, we have a veterinary register from Ooh. 1889 to 1908. So let's say somebody has an ancestor in Berks who was a veterinarian. In that time period, they're probably in this register. Uh, one of the duties of the office that the General Assembly proclaimed in the late 1800s, early 1900s, was that certain types of professions, the, uh, the prothonotary needed to keep a registry of them. So we have this veterinary register. We have an osteopath register. Uh, we have a register of physicians, a dental register, an optometry register, uh, a register of midwives, amazingly. Mm. So I guess if you were looking for a midwife in Berks County in the 1920s, you could consult the register of midwives to find somebody to help you. <laughs> um, the, my favorite, though, is called the Register of Stallions. Huh? So it's a fascinating book, and if anybody ever visits, I'd be glad to show it to them. It's a fascinating book that lists, I guess, if you had owned a horse in Reading or Berks County, you were required under some quirky law to register it, register information about it with the prothonotary's office. So <laughs> I started, I, I did it this morning, I was looking through it, and it has a lot of information. So if, if you know, there's a chance that somebody's ancestor who had a horse, it actually records the horse's name, you know, who its sire and dam are, uh, its weight, its height, uh, who, its, who its owner is and where that owner lives. So it, it could tie into perhaps some people researching a property, an ancestor's property. And, and if the, they have found a record that, that their ancestor had some property in Berks County with some horses on it, they might want to consult this and they might even be able to see what the name of the horse was because most of them are named. It's a fascinating register. It really is. The Register of Stallions. That's fantastic. As soon as this pandemic lifts, I'm going to come and look at it. <laughs> Absolutely. You're, you're more than welcome. I'd be glad to show it to you. Yeah. We're recording in the middle of a pandemic. Who would have thought, you know, <laughs> like you and I were chatting before we hit record. I mean, right. this is crazy. And I, yeah. I have to thank you, like, I feel like triply, quadruple it, you know, for taking the time to be on the podcast, oh, it's you my know, pleasure. in the midst of it. I, I I, we'll release this, you know, in April-ish, you know, when things calm down and people can focus again a little bit. Well, let's hope. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, just thank you so much. And for More just really well. going in depth, I, I really appreciate it. When you have a great staff, and I do have a wonderful staff and a, and a dedicated staff, it makes it easy. It makes my job a lot easier. One of my heroes, I'll say, and I, I don't, I'm not political. So if you follow me on Twitter or <laughs> Facebook, or I'm not I'm not political. I made a pledge to not be political. Do I have a political opinions? Absolutely. Right. But one of my heroes is Ronald Reagan and he had a sign on his desk and I have it on, I have a little, what I call signing desk, not my main desk, but it's off to the side of my main desk. And he has a sign that I, uh, uh, that I definitely subscribe to. It's amazing what you can get done if you do not mind who gets the credit. Mm. So do I like when people say, Hey, you're doing a great job. Sure I do. But it's, it's through my staff and my dedicated management team that I'm able to do this. They're running the office while I'm doing this, this interview. So mm -hmm. um, always, always appreciate it. And always I'm glad to talk to anybody who's interested in genealogy or anything. And it was really great being on the podcast. I 
hope you enjoyed hearing from Jonathan DiCallo and what he does as a prothonotary. And I hope you got inspired to go find some more records on your ancestors that you might not have looked for before. I have just a few more episodes of the podcast for you in season two, and I'd be honored if you could take a few minutes and leave a review of the podcast or send me an email through my website of something that you like so far or something that you want to see next season. This is Denise Allen with PAAncestors.com, and thanks for listening.